Our next speaker is Dr. David Owens, who is going to give us our insect management updates. Uh, I'm going to start the, all right, great. Well, hey, thanks to everyone for logging in this morning and for sticking around. Uh, if you haven't done it yet, I highly recommend that you grab um, you know, a glass of good orange juice or do some laps around your chair because no one has fallen asleep while drinking orange juice or walking around chairs. Uh, for the rest of you, good luck. Uh, so I'm going to cover fresh uh, vegetable updates. I'm going to focus on uh, watermelons and sweet corn and also talk a little bit about um, some cold crops and uh, this is my tomato slide right here. So let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, first, I'm going to start with watermelons. Uh, watermelons have been a major focus of mine since I started, and believe it or not, I did not like watermelons before I came to Delaware. Uh, I've since come around. I've seen the light, especially after many days baking on plastic in the sun. Um, nothing more refreshing than smashing a watermelon open and, and uh, eating it, it right in the field. Uh, so uh, I have been spending quite a bit of time in melons, and I wanted to relate a couple of um, kind of oddball pests, then our expected pests, and then um, others that need to watch out for. So I'm going to start here with the uh, oddballs. Um, this picture on the left, this is all aphid damage to this watermelon plant. This was in one of my plots. This picture was taken on June 9th. And you flip over one of these leaves and it's just completely covered with uh, melon aphids. Um, keep that date in mind, June 9. I'm going to come back to that here in just a little bit. But what you can see here is the leaves have all crinkled up, they've curled down, and you can see the sheen on the black plastic. This is all from honeydew feeding. So these are, this is classic signs for, for aphids. You can spot this, you know, 30, 40 feet away. Uh, the middle, oh, uh, back to aphids real quick. Um, we do have quite a few good aphid products, but in addition to the neonicotinoids, we also have products such as uh, Savanto, uh, Safina, um, and Belief. There's a few others. Uh, check the, the Veggie Rec guide. Uh, those are three products that I've been working with a little bit uh, here and there the last two years. Uh, and they, they're all excellent aphid products. This uh, center picture, that's, that's a very fuzzy picture of a tick. I did not expect to see a tick in the middle of a 45 acre watermelon field, uh, and there it was. Um, so that just goes to show, be checking uh, your clothing and your skin at the end of every day. Uh, ticks carry a number of really nasty diseases. The good news about ticks is that they require a long time to feed before they can transmit those diseases to you. So if you're checking yourself really good at the end of each day, um, the odds of you running into those diseases from ticks is, is lower. Um, so keep yourself safe. Pyrethrin treated clothing is really good, especially for you consultants that are bopping in and out of a lot of different fields and field margins where deer and ticks tend to hide. This other picture here on the right, that was a watermelon transplant that was killed by ants. Never in a million years would I have expected ants to be destroying a watermelon transplant, yet this field that this picture was taken on had quite a bit of destroyed transplants. The only thing I can figure is that it was a field that had a lot of ants in it before the ground was worked up when the ground was worked up, I'm thinking that those ant colonies got scattered around and fragmented. They migrated over to the black plastic looking for heat. And prior to the rice strips uh, senescing or getting uh, sprayed, they were feeding on aphid honeydew. And after the aphids left the rye, uh, uh, cereal aphids, not, not watermelon affecting aphids, uh, the, the next best location for sugar is the sap of the transplant. My understanding is a couple of applications of neonicotinoids through the drip and a couple of applications of pyrethroids over the top clean this problem up. Um, but that's just, that's certainly an oddball um, issue. So our expected pests, striped cucumber beetles and two-spot spider mite. I'm going to start with the striped cucumber beetle. 
this picture at the top right, that is the first striped cucumber beetle that I saw this year. And I found that one on May 23rd. This is about 10 days later than the first striped cucumber beetle I found uh, in 2019. And that's because April and May cooled down quite a bit and didn't start really warming back up till the latter third of the month. Um, why that's important is because if I go back to my aphid picture, those aphids came in well before May 23rd and they were already damaging that plant. I took this photo on June 9 by the time cucumber beetles finally started rolling into uh, this particular field plot. Um, so you do need to be scouting for watermelons. There are reasons to treat melons before striped cucumber rolls in. If at all possible, I'd prefer to keep the neonix applications to the drip for striped cucumber beetle as opposed to uh, hitting aphids with it. And that's because we start losing residual activity. Once watermelons grow quickly, the product really gets diluted down and is not as effective once those melons get to a certain size uh, from an initial transplant application. Um, and we manage watermelon, we manage cucumber beetles and watermelons so that we can avoid uh, a melon that looks like this one that has some severe rind feeding on it. Um, this year we did a couple of striped cucumber beetle trials. And uh, this here is uh, my uh, research associate lab manager. manager. Um, his COVID project in April was to build us a boom that could inject insecticides into small plots conveniently. And this is what we came up with. And I gotta say, cucumber beetles are hard to get good data on. They're so mobile, uh, but this year we, we nailed it. Uh, I was very happy with these data. So we planted road trip watermelons uh, May 13th down at uh, Salisbury. Um, our first application was put out on June 10th as a drip application of Admire Pro. And then a couple of foliar products, uh, Harvanta and an experimental. Um, and you can see the number of dead beetles in these plots. Uh, there's nothing that works as well as the neonicotinoids. Uh, Harvanta looked pretty decent. Uh, the experimental product looked pretty decent. Um, and yes, we, we killed beetles with them. Our second treatment was on July 15th. And keep that date in mind because I'm going to circle back to that one in a moment too. Um, the second application is targeting the first generation beetle emergence. Um, and uh, these were foliar applications entirely, a uh, sail, the experimental, and Harvanta over the top. The, one of the reasons why that's important is, um, you know, we start running into pollinator issues. And, you know, sometimes strike cucumber beetles roll into a field late. Well, if those melons are planted really early, they could be flowering by the time cucumber beetles start rolling in. And that can be a potential issue with, um, with dealing with uh, label restrictions. Also, uh, this here is a picture of um, cantaloupe. I believe that one was taken on June 2nd and striped cucumber beetles rolled in very quickly and started hammering that. In cantaloupe, they transmit uh, bacterial wilt. So you need to be scouting for these things really carefully, roughly right around Memorial Day weekend. We did take our uh, cucumber beetle trial to um, harvest and we graded those melons for rind feeding and severe rind feeding. I categorize severe rind feeding as anything that's larger than about a, a quarter to a half dollar size uh, spot. And um, even though Harvanta and our experimental product didn't kill as many beetles as our Admire sale plot, um, they had about equivalent um, reduction in the number of melons that had rind feeding on them. So that's very encouraging. Uh, Harvanta is more of a, it, it'll stop beetle feeding. It, uh, it's very slow to kill them, might not kill them, but uh, if a beetle's feeding on a, a leaf that's been treated with a diamide, they will um, slow down and stop feeding. So it does provide some rind protection there. The other pest that we've got is two spot spider mite. Um, this here is actually a picture of one of my uh, watermelon transplants in the greenhouse. 
uh, many of the fields that we uh, scouted and actually um, I want to make a shout out to Cody Stubbs. Uh, Cody is a graduate student of mine um, that I've put working on um, watermelon pests. And uh, we started sampling fields uh, in, at the beginning of June. By the time we started sampling, many fields were infested unusually early. And I have a hard time thinking that that was because of uh, the weather. May was unusually cool. Um, it started turning warm at the very end of May and June was hot. This here is a temperature graph of June. But by the time we started sampling, there were very heavy mite, trans, uh, mite populations in some fields. And I think that goes back to our mild winter last year. Uh, we had several days that hit 70 in January and February. Uh, spider mites never fully shut down in and around greenhouses. And so I think that a lot of fields, mites got started early in those greenhouses. I'm going to come back to that point in just a moment. Uh, our spider mite trial on the research station was planted on June 5th and we treated on July 2nd. I try to hit a population that's about a tenth of the size that's on these graphs. Um, the blue bars are our pre-treatment mite counts. Um, and I gotta admit, mites got away from me a little bit. It's something that's very easy to happen, uh, especially when I uh, look at this, these temperatures, we're hitting 90s uh, several times throughout the month. In ideal conditions, spider mite populations can increase tenfold in a week. Um, so it's very easy to, for them to kind of get away from me. Uh, the best product this year was Agrimac. Uh, it resulted in the greatest reduction in two-spot spider mite and kept them down. Um, and then that was kind of followed by uh, Portal mixed with Exponent and Banter. Uh, banter is Acromite. Um, and that is the liquid formulation. Some of you may be familiar with it as Acromite. Um, yeah, acromite. The active ingredient, sorry, is biphenazate, not acromite. Uh, acromite is the, um, the, the, the dry formulation. So we got a couple of different uh, research goals for this year coming up uh, with two-spot spider mite. Uh, one of the major components of Cody's work is looking at biological controls for two-spot spider mite, using predatory mites to control spider mites. In this field block, he's applying insecticides over the top and monitoring how the predatory and spider mites respond to insecticides that are labeled for other pests. Uh, to see it, how we can best integrate a biological control for spider mites with the need to control cucumber beetles and rindworms. Uh, one, of those, um, one of the projects that we're gonna work on this year is releasing predatory mites in commercial fields or potentially in, in greenhouses, especially if these greenhouses do have these um, early season mites starting up. I think that's a very convenient, very easy time to nip a potential problem in the bud. Uh, other rind feeders, uh, this is a beet armyworm. Um, this is not on a watermelon leaf, this is on a pigweed. Beet armyworm really likes pigweeds and then they'll move on to watermelons. So I start, Right around the middle of July, I started looking at pigweeds when I'm going through uh, watermelon fields. Uh, this picture was taken on July 13th. Um, the second cucumber beetle spray date was July 15th down in Salisbury. Beet armyworm has already started moving into the area right around then. Uh, uh, this is a pest that is resistant to pyrethroids and neonicotinoids do nothing against it. That's where diamides like Harvanta and also Exerol has a uh, two double E recommendation. That's where those two products are um, really shine and could be good fits in a uh, insect pest spray program. If Corey Lacates is on, um, I owe him a little bit of an apology. I've kind of gone back and forth with exactly what corn earworms are doing in watermelons. I typically only find earworms in blossoms in both watermelon and winter squash. Um, this here is actually a picture I took on the research station uh, early August, and that is an earworm putting a herding on a watermelon rind. So Corey, they do get onto watermelon rind. So I apologize for 
um, uh, maybe uh, some ignorance on my part. And then uh, another kind of interesting uh, rind feeder. This is uh, a watermelon rind that's been fed on extensively on the ground spot. That is because of a white grub that had taken up residence right underneath of it. So I'm going to uh, transition here to coal crops. Um, and this uh, continues a, a kind of a, a joke that I had in Monday's fruit session where I showed a picture of an apple that was heavily damaged by various insect pests. Uh, in this picture, uh, I admit I'm an entomologist learning how to produce a semi-reasonable looking vegetable field from start to finish is a big learning curve for me. Um, and learning what how to manage weeds with herbicides is a big learning curve. So far, I've managed to learn how to grow weeds really well. Um, so I appreciate all the advice that Mark Van Gessel has been uh, offering me on, on what I need to do better for next year. Coal crops are pretty cool because uh, they get a, a tremendous diversity of pests. Some of them are very specific to coal crops uh, and some of them are not. Um, up on the top, I've got the pests that are easier to control, imported cabbage worm, cabbage looper. Um, these are the perennial pests. They're going to be present from the early spring all the way to the end of the season. Cross-striped worms typically show up in summer. Um, and then the other two are very sporadic. On the bottom, these are the pests that are harder to control. Uh, Diamondback moth is resistant to a lot of insecticides. Corn earworm is resistant to pyrethroids. Beet armyworm is resistant to uh, pyrethroids. We can expect diamondback moth in some level pretty much the entire season. This is one though that really prefers hot, dry weather. Now, just as we've got a tremendous diversity of worms, we also have a tremendous diversity of beneficial insects that attack these worms. So we wanna keep these things around as much as possible. Um, and the good news is we've got 11 different modes of action available for worm control. And a lot of these are fairly soft on beneficial insects. The ones that are not are pyrethroids, um, depending on the crop, uh, you might be able to apply an organophosphate or uh, lanate. Um, and besiege is also kind of in this category because it's a premix of a diamide and a pyrethroid. We want to save those for the later end of the season because those are going to be the hardest on natural enemies. Natural enemies give us free pest control. One quick note on um, uh, pest management for coal crops. Spreaders and stickers really aid in product performance, especially with BTs and Avant. Uh, but be careful with stickers when applying a diamide. Stickers keep the insecticide on the leaf. The diamide chemistry is uh, translocated throughout the plant, so it wants to move into the plant. So in that case, we're kind of working against um, our chemistry. When we apply insecticides, we go with this uh, three nozzle boom uh, with two nozzles on, on drops to get really good coverage. A lot of these worm pests will hide on the underside of leaves. And I, I've got one more quick note on the Mid-Atlantic Veggie Rex. Insecticides that are labeled for, actually all of our insecticides, they're arranged by mode of action group number, not necessarily by recommended use order. Uh, in fact, our best worm products that I recommend hands down are actually here at the bottom, um, like Avant and Corrigan and some others. Uh, so just, you know, if, uh, if you're new to using the guide, just keep that in mind. They're arranged by sequential order of the mode of action, not necessarily by um, which ones are the best options. So getting into uh, the results of uh, a small kale trial, um, kale is a, is a bug magnet and um, grows really well in the summertime and keeps things around for the fall. Uh, this year, diamondback moth wasn't that bad for us. Imported cabbage worms and cabbage loopers were highly abundant. And um, in this, uh, Corrigan was hands down uh, the, the best material. Uh, Proclaim did pretty well. Most of these worms in the Proclaim uh, treatment were small, like first, second instar worms. 
uh, and that's because its residual activity is less than that of corrigin. Uh, Torac is, um, is a bit of an interesting chemical. It's got some powdery mildew activity with it. Uh, it is a broad spectrum insecticide, but there are some insects that it does not do a good job on. And one of those is cabbage looper. Cabbage looper is not on its label, um, and it, it did not touch the cabbage loopers. Most of the imported cabbage worms in our Torac plots were either very large or very small. Uh, very small because its residual activity was declining, or very large because our first application, we had large worms in the, um, in the field plot. In our cabbage trial, we had a uh, very high aphid pressure this year. Uh, we planted our cabbage on August 13th, and uh, by middle of October, we had some plants that were so heavily infested that they did not produce heads. Uh, this here is a picture of a, a cabbage plant that is producing a head, albeit a very small one. And all this kind of black stuff on the wrapper leaves, those are all aphids. Uh, we did drop in um, Savanto, uh, Actera, and Admire Pro on, um, on these aphids, and uh, they, they all knocked them back really well. There's a couple of other very aphid-specific products that are labeled for cabbage. The advantage that Actera and Admire Pro have when dealing with aphids is they are also very good on harlequin bug. We planted our cabbage right next to our summertime kale plot and harlequin bugs start moving over and they took out my first guard row before we, um, we got them under control with, uh, with some neonics. Uh, looking at our worm products, um, most of them did, did really well. Uh, again, Torac was a little bit soft on uh, the, the imported cabbage worms and cabbage loopers. Uh, we did have some issues with, um, with that Leprotect. It's a, it's a BT Kerstaki. Um, the addition of Spear, Spear is a new product. It's based off of uh, spider venoms. Um, that did help it. Uh, there are other BTs that are better, such as uh, BT Azawi strain. Um, and then the same comment with the Proclaim and uh, the Ryman and the Radiant about the worm sizes. Uh, just running out of residual activity before our next application. Uh, Intrepid and Ryman, those are both growth regulators, so you want to target very small worms uh, with those materials. Now, our cool October shut down worm activity uh, quite a bit before we harvested these plots, so we had, uh, we had a lot of marketable heads, uh, very little treatment separation. Uh, of the worm products, we had the best uh, marketability from Radiant and Ryman. Um, the reason why we had some hits in some of these others, like the Corrigin, uh, the Intrepid, and our high rate of Proclaim, is because of this jerkwad on the left. That is corn earworm. Corn earworms, when they get into cabbage, they burrow in deep and they hit that developing head. And once they get in there, they're very hard to control with insecticides. Um, we had quite a few cabbage plants that were essentially eaten out because of corn earworm. Uh, I, I said that uh, that picture on my title slide was uh, my whole slide on tomato. We had very little worm pressure in our tomato plots. It was, it was actually rather depressing. Most of the uh, worm damaged tomatoes here in our untreated check plot, we picked those up two weeks after I stopped um, spraying the field. Um, we had a, a very light mixture of corn earworm. Uh, we had a little bit of cabbage looper. Um, and this tomato here, I think a hornworm did that one because um, the, the feeding scar on that is very shallow but very wide. Either a hornworm or a yellow striped armyworm did that one. Corn earworm tends to drill holes in the side of the, the tomato. And there's a small earworm just starting up on that tomato there on the very bottom left. So I'm not going to spend any more time on tomatoes. Uh, I'm going to try to cover some sweet corn um, updates. I'm starting to run a little bit long and I, I could probably talk all day on sweet corn. I will be discussing uh, sweet corn pest management more tomorrow in the processing uh, session. Um, so I'm going to try to focus on 
Uh, go ahead, Gordon. Yeah, Dave, uh, take another five minutes uh, and uh, uh, for your session. All right. Uh, so just quick, real quick, um, fresh market, you know, aphids can be more of an issue than in the processing. Um, aphids are a product of pyrethroid applications for worms. Uh, and really the best products for aphids are Asale, Savanto, and Lanate. Um, for corn earworm, we've, we're very limited in our mode of actions that we have available. We've got pyrethroids, we've got diamides, and we've got radiant. Radiant is very inconsistent by when it's applied by itself. But that led me to ask the question, can we use it as a tank mix? And then we've got a few products that are labeled for uh, rural feeding worms. Uh, Ryman is labeled for silking stage sweet corn, but to my knowledge, uh, it has not been evaluated in spray trials here in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, so that's a 2021 goal. Uh, we did have some fall armyworms show up uh, in mid-July and August with spotty whorl infestations. I'm going to touch on this one a little bit more tomorrow, uh, but when you scout for fall armyworm, you want to make sure that you are in fact uh, seeing live worms. The damage that fall armyworm does to sweet corn is very eye-catchy, uh, but by the time that you noticed it in these large holes in the leaves, they may have already left. They do about 80% of their feeding within the last three to four days of their larval development. So by the time you see this, they're gone. Um, and our thresholds are pretty high. Uh, mid rural infestation thresholds are around 30%. And 30% uh, infestation looks like a bomb went off in a field. But we really need to pay attention to that emerging tassel. What you don't want to see is window painting on the husk leaves or egg masses anywhere on the plant right around tassel push. Because um, what happens is those, those worms develop and they will drill in through the side of the ear. Uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, this is a army worm that drilled into the ear during pollination and this whole side of the ear did not get pollinated because of that. Um, I'm going to cover insecticides more tomorrow uh, for uh, time reasons, uh, but with fresh market, we do have opportunities to use BT. Um, the performance series sweet corns do a little bit better job of controlling whorl feeding armyworm. Um, but when it comes to ear protection, Corn earworms are resistant to our performance and our attribute series sweet corns. Um, so you really need to treat these the same way as you would treat a non-BT uh, sweet corn. Um, the only exception to that is the attribute two and attribute plus sweet corn lines. Those have a uh, Viptera gene in them and it provides 100% control of corn earworm in the ear. I did find a European corn borer uh, this past year. This is the only European corn borer I've ever seen. And that's because we have a lot of BT field corn that's planted. And that has led to a region-wide suppression of European corn borer. But this is something that we will be uh, trapping for with pheromone traps uh, this year coming up. Um, let's see here real quick. Uh, you all saw this slide last year with our pyrethroid treated vials. This year, um, we picked up more resistant moths earlier, and I think that's because our warm winter allowed them to overwinter more successfully. We've got some partial pyrethroid resistance. That's led me to ask the question, um, is that equivalent among all the pyrethroids or is one better than another? Um, so we, we've been testing them individually. In 2019, uh, Baythroid, looked a little bit better than Asana, Mustang, or Warrior in a separate block. In 2020, the differences weren't quite as clear. Uh, Baythroid is right here in the middle, and it's still, it's a little bit better than Brigade and Warrior, but it's not, uh, it's not a drastic difference. Um, in our second spray trial, uh, it looked a little bit stronger than Warrior, and Brigade was intermediate. Tom Kuhar ran a kind of a parallel study, and I wanna focus on these Eastern Shore results here. Um, in his trials, Hero and Bifenthrin 
were the best pyrethroids. Uh, and bathroid was equivalent with the others. Um, so there's a little bit of a, a regional difference. Where Brigade really shines is this. This was caused by uh, uh, hemipterans, like uh, stink bugs. And it was particularly severe in our first two trials. The bifenthrin active ingredient in Elevest and in Brigade is very good against hemipterans. Uh, if you're growing uh, sweet corn near a lot of bees, you may want to consider Corrigin as your first application, particularly if your earworm pressure is low to moderate um, and you don't have stink bugs in the mix. Uh, Corrigin can sometimes look inconsistent, especially in high pressure situations. Um, this here, you, if you look closely, you can see a ton of bees working on the pollen on this sweet corn. Sweet corn sheds pollen early in the morning and then a little bit in the early evening. So avoid those times when you're spraying. Uh, this field, uh, it's not like a beehive when the corn was shedding pollen. And that's because a quarter mile down the road, there were 60 beehives pollinating watermelons. So they were in here uh, trying to get some late pollen. Uh, real quick, because uh, I'm over on time, Spotted Lanternfly, Kent County is in the Spotted Lanternfly quarantine zone now. Um, so businesses moving equipment, moving trucks, moving plant material need to have permits. Uh, you can get um, free employee training and free permits through DDA's website. A uh, couple of very quick insecticide updates. FMC is reformulating chlorantronilaprole to a new product called Vantacore. Uh, it's more concentrated, so the use rate is low, and they will be making this available in quart-sized bottles, um, which is a, a big change. Uh, Savanto High Load has been released by Bayer, and Zeal now has a sweet corn label for two-spot spider mite, and Corteva is no longer manufacturing chlorpyrifos. Uh, miscellaneous pests to watch out for, these are blister beetles. Um, don't pick them up, they get their name for a reason. And we had a lot of blister beetles this past year. Um, and our woolly worm weather prediction forecast is confused. Uh, my woolly worm that I found in November said that we were gonna have a warm November. My woolly worm that I found in December said, no, no, that wasn't right. We should have had a cold November. So take that one with a grain of salt. And I could not have done any of this work without uh, Joe Didesheimer there in the center, uh, my graduate student Cody Stubbs and Samantha Cotton working in the summer, uh, as well as uh, several people at Carvel that helped out with uh, maintaining trials, um, some university collaborators and uh, funding uh, sources from Delaware Department of Ag, their specialty crop block grant program has funded spider mite and cucumber beetle work uh, Sussex County Council and industry partners, uh, Friels and insecticide um, companies. So with that, I, um, I'll take any questions if there's a moment or two. Otherwise, you can email me anytime.